now invite Boston City Councilor Felix Arroyo. I had a funny thought. I felt like I was almost about to do a stand up. Wait, you got the answer. <laughs> do it, do it. Huh? Yeah. Felix Arroyo, I used to know. Explain. Uh, Freeman, every now and then a father will name their son after themselves. And when that happens, you have the same name. And you're a little bit younger. And then he ends up getting in the same office? That sounds like a conspiracy to me. No, all right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you mean heckled just like it's a scandal? Yeah, that just happened. It did. It did. I'm sorry, folks. It's just my cousin and I. Uh, so here we go. I wanted to talk to you about um, this little thing uh, that I call collabor collaborative politics. So sort of picture yourself as a kid who, who was born right here in Boston and raised in Hyde Park and went to the public schools, who, who felt very lucky to go to higher education, but it was state school, um, who knew growing up, who, who had, and, and I suspect there may be people here who will relate to this, who knew what it was like to turn the oven on in the winter and open a door because heat came out of it and who knew what it was like to put water on a stovetop and boil it, because that how, that's how you had a hot bath. And so that was my growing up. And then, but at the same time, being raised by parents who, who were just, I, I wish every child was as lucky I, as I was to have the parents that I have. That's the best way to describe it who not only cared for me and loved for me and all of my brothers and sisters, there's a total of five of us, but taught us all uh, the concept. My dad used to describe it because he was in English as a second language speaker. You know, he came from Puerto Rico not speaking any English, really looking for a better opportunity for himself and his family. And I believe he found that here in Boston. And he used to say, English is kind of funny because Sometimes the same words mean two things. Isn't that ridiculous? <laughs> Those of you who only speak English have no idea how funny the language is. <laughs> Those of us who speak two languages think it's hysterical and we hate learning it. <laughs> right? It's like, here are the rules, except after C. What? It doesn't make any sense. Why would, I not, why would E and I ever change their order? Uh, and he said, you is an interesting word and you will never make it if the only definition of the word you you use is its singular term. But I say that to me. I thought it was like brilliant. You say, because I could be saying, how are you? And everybody knows what I just did. Or I could say, how are you? And I just spoke to everybody. And so my dad said, always think about you making it by using that plural definition. Right? As if, like, you make it. Y'all. <laughs> or what my English teacher would refer to as the incorrect statement of y'all. <laughs> uh, so, picture that kid with that upbringing. Picture him being 29 years old and saying to himself, you know what I want to do? I want to run for office in Boston. And I want to run citywide, and I want to win. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's kind of silly. So what most trainings will tell you, even the progressives want they'll tell you, you have to think about where you're raising your money. Go through your phone book, right? They'll say, go through your phone book. Everyone you went to school with, call them for money. I was like, oh, I went to the public school. It's like, <laughs> you know, I got a friend who's doing great. He's a UPS driver, and they're doing awesome. You know, and, but see, it's, it's, when you give these trainings, I think often it's forgotten that the person in front of you, their Rolodex, anyone doesn't know what a Rolodex is, back in the day, they used to be this. <laughs> so it isn't as, as, as full with people who have a lot of disposable income, right? Uh, and so I thought, well, that's not going to work. For me, that's not possible. But I still had that dream, because I really believe that government needs people who, who look at things differently, who come from different places, and who, who really are committed to thinking about people that I think sometimes aren't seen. 
But if that's what you believe, and if that's where you come from, how do you turn that into a winning campaign in a political environment that tells you you can't win if you don't raise the most money? See that? You can't win if you, have, you don't have the most power brokers telling everybody else to vote for you. <coughs> right now, if you open a newspaper, there's plenty of movement in Massachusetts politics. Everyone's viability by the media is defined by how much money they've raised. Right? Immediately defined by how much money they've raised. They don't go into your values, who you are, how hard you worked your whole life. They'll literally say, Robbie raised a million bucks, and Joyce raised a hundred thousand, Robbie's the most viable candidate. Without going any deeper. Well, I didn't like that model. So we decided we were gonna do something called collaborative politics. And what was that idea? If I wanted, if I believed in a government where everybody had a say, and I believed in a government where your socioeconomic status did not define the amount of power you should have, <coughs> and how much people listen to you, and I wanted to govern in that way, and behave that way, then I had to campaign a different way. I had to believe enough in the power of people that I would depend on organizing people to win. I had to take that leap of faith. faith. I had to jump off the cliff with that belief. Or else, I was lying to you and lying to myself. So, what, something, I guess I've never explained it to Robbie this way. While others spend time raising their liquid capital, I spend an awful lot of time raising human capital. Because I have a question for you, a real one. How much do you pay a volunteer? <laughs> hours, we, hours upon hours. We pay them pizza. Yeah. <laughs> so if you like pizza, you might want to come volunteer with us, because we have a lot of that. All right? Well, that was the concept. But as an organizer, how do you get people to buy in so that they'll give you hours? How on earth would I be able to approach Robbie? And I pick on him because he's a close friend. And by the way, I met him this way. I did not know Robbie before I was running for office. He did not know me, and we met in his first campaign. How would I ever approach Robbie, who has a million things going on in his life, and say, I know you got a lot going on, but why don't you knock on 50 doors for me? 50 of the closest people to your home who you don't know yet. And talk to them about a person you just met. And tell them he should be your leader. <laughs> Why? I met him five minutes ago, and he was really a nice guy. Right? How do I do that? You know how you do that? By inviting Robbie to be a part of all of it. Not just the vote getting part. It has to be a part of all of it. And I have to understand that if I wanted to be that different type of elected official, I had to be that different type of candidate. And I had to build a campaign team that was bigger than me. If I asked people to believe in me, then I needed to in turn believe in them. And that meant that there would be times when we were talking about strategy that people would be in the room who I only met a week before, but could sit in a room and if they made a valid case for taking a, this campaign in a different direction, that we would listen to it and quite possibly do it. That being a good leader sometimes means being a good follower and believing that the people around you are smarter than you conceive the world in a different way than you ever could, and that their perspective is valid. So we built a campaign team of all volunteers. We had one paid person in our campaign for citywide race. One paid person. And I'm afraid to tell you what I paid them because I'm in a union hall, and I don't want anyone. <laughs> it, you, we'll talk about this outside and later. Um, you know, I, I think we, literally I just paid his rent. And somehow, I think he ate out of, you know, 
cold cereal, no milk, right? That was it. Everyone else was a volunteer, yet we had a team of about 20 people who put in almost as much time as me. And so there we were working it, you know, there were people in the media who said I wouldn't even make the finals. Eight people made the finals. Eight. Now, in fairness, there were like 22 of us running, so I couldn't pick all 22 to make the finals. But they, they said, you wouldn't make the finals. And I think it's because they were focused on my money and how much money we raised. But they had no sense of what grassroots meant. The term's been co-opted, by the way, folks. Grassroots now looks good on a piece of paper to tell you that that's what we do. But grassroots is not grass tops. It, right? There's a difference. Yeah. It's a little more clear when I explain it that way, but frankly, there's a difference. <laughs> it's right there. It's where it comes from. It's at that ground level. How do you judge the viability of a candidate if you can't see that? And the candidate whose name's on the ballot, who's like, boy, I really need to pay my mortgage, you have to believe in that. Because if you don't believe in that, you immediately fall into the trap that we often all fall into. Going to known power. Right? What we recognize as power in asking for their help. Worst case scenario, doing things that aren't you to get it. Worst case scenario, we don't all do that. I'm, you know, you can walk down that path. Or we could redefine what power is. That's collaborative politics. That's it. Now, it sounds in a room of organizers um, that you would think, of course you would do that. Why wouldn't you? No, of course you wouldn't do that. How many organizers do we have elected to office? But as organizers, right, you might, politics isn't the end all be all even to me, and this is what I do every day. But it's necessary, because the decisions around healthcare happen there. Decisions around immigration reform happens there. Emphasis in our public schools happened there. Even things that we all need in our lives, like safe and livable communities. You know, clean parks. Sidewalks. Sidewalks. <laughs> the transgender rights bill. All that, the final decisions get made in buildings. And if we continue to allow it to be essentially out to the highest bidder. Well then who, who has more say in these final decisions? You? Do you believe that? Even today, do you believe that? Do you believe when you walk into these different political realms that your voice is as valuable as the next person's? Do you truly believe that? Raise your hand if you really believe that. Like four of you. You see that? Question. Do you truly believe when you walk into City Hall or the State House or Capitol Hill or to the White House that your voice is as powerful as some of the richest people in this country? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Right? And do you believe that the people listening to you believe that as well? <laughs> Anybody believe that? <laughs> no? Room full of good voters and nobody believes that? <laughs> All right, room full of people that, have, there are people in this room who have never missed an election, but we don't believe that, right? I think it depends on the leader that you're speaking with. Sure, but what I'm saying is it also depends on us not falling into those traps of saying viability equals most money. I think viability from now on should be how much human capital did you raise? How many people did you raise and how do you show that? There were literally meetings for my campaign, decision-making meetings where final decisions were being made on policy, final decisions were being made on strategy, I wasn't even in the room. I wasn't even there. Actually, I left because I wanted to keep coaching my baseball team and I asked to go coach a, <laughs> to go coach a baseball game. And I told them, hey guys, I gotta go coach this game. And they looked at me like I was weird. I put on my uniform, put that little hat on. I said, I'm out. And like, well, what about all these decisions? I said, hey, you believe in me, I believe in you. I think we all in this room have a sense of where we want our city to go. You make those decisions, we'll just, we'll implement them and we'll get to work. And we won. Go figure. It happened. Right? Twice. We won twice. 
citywide, and we did pretty good in both elections, actually. So thanks to anyone here who helped that happen. Um, but then it doesn't stop there, right? Because I truly believe the way you campaign is absolutely going to be a, reflect a reflection of how you govern, or it should be. And I could judge the way somebody will be as an elected official based on what type of campaign they run. I can. I feel like I can. So we, we decided we were going to try our best while we're in elected office to do it the way we ran our campaign. So I lobbied really hard and I got very lucky in that I got the chair of a committee called Labor, Youth Affairs, and Health. What did we immediately do? We called 30, 30 youth organizations from across the city. And we said, hey, I chaired a committee on youth affairs. 30 youth organizations across the city, different neighborhoods, um, you know, youth organizations like Bagley that represent folks with different sexual orientations and, and you know, across the city. We said, I, I have the committee on youth affairs. Why don't we all come in and get together and figure out what do we want to do with it? And I found that for the first 15 minutes of the meeting, they kept looking at me, well, what are you going to do? Well, then, and what are you going to do? And finally, I, I kind of said, ha, ha, I tricked you. This isn't for me to tell you what I'm going to do for you. This is for you to tell me what you need me, what you need me to do for you. And then it doesn't stop there. I have a rule. If you voice it, then you've got to be prepared to be a part of it. So how many of you want to join our youth? committee. How many of you actually want to be a part of the youth committee? So the 30 different youth organizations, all 30 of them said yes and brought in, I think we're at about 40 now, because I also don't know what I don't know. There were people who should have been in that room that I didn't know, and they knew. That was my first maybe two, month in office. I'm now in my fourth year. We have met religiously. We've held rallies with, with hundreds and hundreds of young people at City Hall. Hall. We've been able to get over 10,000 summer jobs for young people in this city every year that I've been in office. And guess what? I didn't do it. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I get to give you the good news. You smile at me, you like me more, and I didn't even do it. <laughs> All I did was let the people who are good at what they do, who do that work every day, come in the building and help me get it done. A good leader knows when to follow. It helped me get it done. And guess what? I'm one of 13 counselors, but when you got hundreds and hundreds of teenagers standing behind you, you might as well be the only counselor. Because at that point, who's going to look at these young people and tell them, no, you don't need a summer job? Or tell them, we don't care what you have to say, we're going to close your library anyway. And that's how we operated. And then I said, well, this. It's awesome. My work is easier, right? Here we're a group of people doing the organizing work. What we want to accomplish happens, and all I have to learn how to do is share the credit. Great. I'm down. So I also chair a committee on the committee is Labor, Youth Affairs, and Health. I used to be a healthcare organizer. I was a union organizer, and I was a youth sports coach. Tell me that committee is not awesome. <laughs> right? I walk in, I was like, really? Did I just pull this off? Oh my God, I can't believe this happened to me. So the minute we got the health committee, we said, geez, we wanna, I want to work on asthma. I'm a lifelong asthmatic. That's what I knew about asthma. <laughs> but I wanted to work on it. So what do you think we did? What do you think we did? How did I decide? Called a bunch of health boards, which doctors? called a bunch of folks, either providers or advocates, who'd worked on the issue of asthma. I know you're thinking, come on, Felix, this is way too easy. Obviously, you would pick up the phone and call a bunch. No, not obviously. They've never had a group of 30 people participate in the Youth Advisory Committee before, ever. The city councils have been around for 100 years. We put together an asthma task force. They're not, there's not 30 asthma groups out there, by the way. I found out there's more like 10. And we bring them in, and then we get some stuff done. You know, we got done. We tried to make it so that you couldn't smoke in any public park. That was my attempt. Because my attitude was, if I had a bunch of kids, like I used to when I was coaching, playing at a public park, why should they deal with you smoking around them? Is that, is that 
as a city, as a community, we ask you to go outside and exercise, maybe on our tennis courts, basketball courts, football field, soccer field, baseball field. Name the sport if you do it in a public park. Why should you deal with someone's smoke? Smoke is in the room. I'm okay with you smoking. That's cool. But you, you know, probably can smoke off on a sidewalk. It doesn't have to be in that park while that, especially when those the kids are playing. So I didn't get that. I tried and I didn't get it. You know what we got? We got no smoking in any tall lot in the city of Boston. You know how we got it? Because these asthma groups, these ten asthma groups, started lobbying around that issue. We also started to do studies on what cleaning products we use in our schools, libraries, and community centers. Because most people assume that if you have a clean room, you took care of anyone who might have issues, uh, health issues as it relates to dust, right? You, everyone would assume that. But actually, the products you use are sometimes more damaging than the dust. Because if you race to the bottom and buy the cheapest stuff, just guess what's in it and how unhealthy that is. We started doing that kind of work. And then we started doing some research and we found out that Suffolk County, which is what we, we live in, if you live in Boston, Revere, Winthrop, Winthrop Chelsea. Thank you. Uh, I'm a Boston kid. <laughs> Once you say something out of Boston, I sometimes I got to bring my passport. <laughs> but those three towns, one city, make up Suffolk County. You know what we found out? Suffolk County is the third worst county in the country when it comes to diesel pollution, diesel particulate matter in the air. Number three. So every time you go outside, take a jog. Guess what's happening? This is a country that includes LA. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, everyone has that picture, don't you? They beat us. I know it. Whoa. <laughs> Right? You're like, oh my God, I can't believe they beat us. Like, okay. damn. <laughs> so, what, what did we start doing? We decided, well, let's figure out, this the group. Let's figure out how to fix this. And then another organization, ACE, a lot of you might know them, Alternatives for Community and Environment. Uh, they did a whole lot of work with their young people around that particular issue. And the research they found says 40% of that pollutant comes from one industry. So out of the 100% of what's putting us in the top three, 40 comes from one industry, construction, the diesel vehicles. And what's coming out of the back of them is essentially poison. So now, it hasn't passed yet, but now with these group, the asthma uh, coalition we put together with ACE and their young people, now you've seen what's happening, all the groups coming together for different things. We're moving legislation that would say if you wanted to do construction in the city of Boston, your vehicle has to either be post-2007, they figured it out, and it's, and it's nowhere near as bad, or you have to retrofit your vehicle so that most of the pollutant coming out would, would be gone. It clears up almost up to 85%. And then we thought, you know, it would be really nice if we did it as a city, and we did. Now the legislation hasn't passed yet, but the city's already retrofitted its fleet. Uh, Robbie told me I'm going too long. So what I'll say is this. Anyone in this room, is there anyone in this room who's thinking about running for office? <laughs> I knew you were going to raise your hand. It was just don't run against me. <laughs> if, when you run for office, you start to plan your strategy with that old school mentality about what power is and what power looks like. Even if you win, you already lost. Even if you win, you already lost. But if you believe that people actually matter, and if you know, like I know, that organized people have never lost to organized money in this country as long as we've stayed together and stayed the course, if you believe that, like I believe that, then your campaign has, has to reflect that. Because if your campaign doesn't reflect that, I know one thing from my own personal experience. You will govern the way you campaign. And you will respond to those that you believe got you in office. And it is terribly freeing for me to feel as though the people who got me in office are you. 
and not the richest 1% of this country. So when they come and they say, we won't support you, I go, oh, wait, wait, you never have. <laughs> <laughs> and then they go, ah, ah. They look around and go, damn, that is true. And it's so freeing to behave that way. And you start to not fear losing an election. You start to not worry about just being who you are. But that can only happen if your campaign reflects those ideas. But if your campaign is a race to get the most money, then spend like crazy for every vote you get, then you just taught yourself that votes can be bought. And if a voter can be bought, then why can't you? And so collaborative politics says, we can't be bought. It says we're gonna support people based on their values and who they are and their commitment to our neighborhoods and our communities. And if that's how you win, then that's how you go. So thanks for the time. I appreciate all of you, and I want to thank you, Robbie, for all the time you put into this. And all the time you put into helping me. So, Robbie says I have uh, time for questions. Actually, Robbie, why don't you come up here? You help me facilitate this. And I'll follow your lead, and whenever you say we're done, we're done. I'll be doing my quadrants. All right, so because I was like making a lot of eye contact with you, so I'll go with you. Um, I actually, I, I have. Kind of a strange question. It's not really about running. Um, when I tell people that I'm a community organizer in Dorchester, they kind of like me go, "Huh? Like, well, what does that mean? Um, what if you had like a 30-second pitch for what is a community organizer or what is a community campaign, a grassroots campaign? How would you answer that?" You know, question? It's funny. All right, I'll say this. I went to a, a meeting, a neighborhood association meeting in Dorchester, uh, and I said to someone, "I'm a community organizer." as one of the reasons why I should be elected. And he said, come on, what is that? And I said, that's you, bro. <laughs> you got 20 people in the room. <laughs> They're volunteering in the neighborhoods to make the neighborhood better. You, my friend, our community, I'm you. And that's how I defined it, it actually worked. Right, anyone who, who, I hate talking in platitudes, but if you believe we're stronger together, then, then you're already on the first step of being a community organizer. If you've ever approached somebody and, and talked to them about anything that you believe in and got them to help you towards moving that, then you already started organizing. Um, there's a big difference between community organizing and mobilizing, uh, huge. One is based on numbers of people who come to something uh, which is still important, and the other one is based on really, instead of getting people to come to something, it's getting people to do uh, basically what you're doing. Um, and then be real careful when you fall into the realm of manipulating and, and sort of, right? So a community organizer would never have in its, in its jar, of, I think a community organizer will never have in its box of tools deceit or lies. Right, because if, if deceit and lies, because if part of your strategy is to lie about something, well, anybody can be strategic if you're willing to lie, right? And if that's part of then it's not community organizing, then it gets into manipulation. I know that's not who you are, because I know you so well, but I will, and everyone in the room know there is a difference in my mind between organizing and mobilizing. Mm -hmm. We're doing quadrants. Um, I got a call yesterday from a female about a hypothetical mayor run. And that got me thinking, um, I'm interested in how you make a decision about whether you're going to, to run, run. Like, what factors you Okay, about all right, so I'm going to answer this question sort of as a fact. I don't want anyone to think that I came here looking for support for a potential mayoral campaign. Uh, Robbie will be calling me later about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, he asked, I got a call from somebody who, who we both know uh, asking uh, him about a potential mayoral support for me. I'm glad you asked the question, not because I need to talk about the mayor's race now, but because it's proof that I believe in what I'm telling you. Yes, I am considering running for mayor. How much money do you have? <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. None. But did we call you? Who did I call in my consideration process? Guys, you have to believe. If you don't believe in this, then why would anybody else? And so when I make the decision whether or not to run for mayor, I'm under no illusions 
whether or not I will have the most money in the race. I get it. I wouldn't care if I had five thousand dollars in the bank. They raise liquid capital. I raise human capital. And so, what we're doing now, what the, the folks who are interested in this are doing, they're spending a lot of time calling a lot of people and asking them, "If Felix jumped off the cliff, would you jump off with him?" <laughs> right? That's it. And so I'm glad you just said that, because it's proof of what I just told you about how we build our campaigns. Some people do it by the number of, of, by the size of donations they receive. I would do it by the number of donors I get, because that's the human capital that I think you would need to run the type of campaign I would want to run, and I actually think it would win. But I'm not at a place here where I'm announcing anything. I'm just saying that we're in the process of seeing if, I could, if we can raise enough human capital to put a formidable campaign. All right, one more question, Robbie says. Do you want to go way in the back? All right, that's why I used to sit in high school, by the way. No, I'm, I'm just curious with this collaborative politics. Suppose you are an and you have the approach at Catholic community. How do you collaborate uh, taking them into your human capital? If you're an atheist. Suppose you are an atheist. atheist okay. And you are approaching a Catholic church community. How would community. you be able to collaborate with them? How do you collaborate with them? Any All right. No. Else? So you're talking about a distinct difference, but there's clearly a difference. I don't know. Suppose you're Puerto Rican, and that's only four percent of the city of Boston, and you want to represent the whole city. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you 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 focus on your commonalities. You don't focus on where you disagree. Actually, I'll end it with this. I'm glad you asked that question. I have learned something in politics, and I'm so grateful I had the opportunity to learn, and I hope we can all learn. Agreement is entirely overrated. <laughs> I mean it. If I only wanted to work with people who agree with me, I would be living the most egocentrical life possible. That already assumes that you're always right. And that your way of looking at something is the only way. And that for you to be right, someone else has to be wrong. Get it? Agreement is entirely overrated. I only care about understanding. I have now since learned that I don't need to agree with you to work with you. I just need to understand you. I just need to understand why you do what you do. I just need to understand, Robbie, why do you put so much time into this stuff? <laughs> right? Tina, why are you putting so much time into this? And they'll tell you. Everyone wants to tell you. Everyone wants to be heard. You want me to listen to you, and I want you to listen to me. We inherently want people to understand us. We confuse it by thinking we want people to agree with us. And so that's how you build collaborations with people who come from different places, whether it's economically, whether it's race, whether it's religion, whether it's sexual orientation, whether it's geography. That's how you do it. Because you stop focusing on agreement being the, the, the goal. Understanding should always be the goal. Then you'll be able to work together. And so that, I think, is how if you were an atheist, I'm not saying that you are, but that's the question you posed. If you were an atheist, how you would approach Catholics? Because you would try to understand where people are coming from. In that understanding, you would see what you could work together on. And once you found what you could work together on, my friend, you just found out 90% of what you needed to be able to build a winning organizing campaign. Thank you. I get to be the first out of lunchtime, but I'm not going to eat because I'm on a diet. And it might have something to do with the question James asked me. So I will have a take more coffee. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.